Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am that host of yours, Liv. I am here with another conversation episode. This is one with Dr. Ellie Mackin-Roberts, author of Heroines of Olympus, which I highly recommend you pick up. I mean, I think the name says it all, but it is a book about the women of Greek mythology. Ellie is also doing some specialized research in Persephone and Hades and her PhD in Underworld Gods, so she was the absolute perfect person to talk about Persephone and the different versions of her and interpretations of her. I learned so much in this episode. I mean, I know I say that a lot, but in this case, Ellie talks about a version of Persephone from the south of Italy and all these incredibly cool things that very real women did kind of in her name. I'm going to let Ellie take it from here, but honestly, I can't express how fascinating it was learning about real people in Greece and how they interacted with these gods that we know super well. I also asked her a really interesting question about Again, real people and how they interacted with the mythology back then. I do want to flag that. We do talk pretty explicitly about rape and sexual assault, both in the mythology and in the ancient world. I think it's a really fascinating conversation, a fairly important one, but it also could be quite triggering more so than a lot of my other episodes. So just a note for that. The portion of that conversation that might be problematic comes after the ad break and the music, so you can know there to sort of watch out or stop listening, whatever you need. But honestly, overall, this episode was absolutely fascinating. I learned so much. You will too. These conversations are so much fun. Conversations, Kore, Persephone, Real Women and the Dread Goddess of the Underworld with Dr. Ellie Mackin Roberts. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. I'm here with Dr. Ellie Mackin Roberts to talk all about. Persephone, thank you so much. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to. So Persephone, I I mean, she is, I mean, she's certainly one of the most beloved on the internet when it comes to gods, goddesses, characters in general. And then you are, am I right in understanding you're studying her and Hades quite in-depthly right now for some sort of academic reason. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So my PhD and then the monograph that came out last year out of that uh, was on underworld gods more generally um, in Greece, specifically mm. Greek religion and literature. And so obviously I looked quite a lot at Hades and Persephone among others. At the moment, I am also writing a book for Routledge's Gods and Heroes series on Hades. So I'm looking quite a lot at Persephone for that as well. But I'm also another one of these people who just have piles and piles and piles of things. Um, (laughs) I am also trying to organize an edited collection, which I'm very, very tentatively calling Persephone in Love. Uh, which is about the reception of Ooh. Persephone in pop culture. So it's something that I'm really interested in. Um, Persephone was the first entry in my Heroines of Olympus book that I wrote, and then I was really sad that I had finished with her. Um, so I kind of kept kept working. But, I mean, she just keeps coming up in my life. 
I'm at present doing doing quite a lot of stuff around Persephone in uh, the Southern Italian context, which I think is super interesting, um, particularly in comparison to what we find in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, like that big standard story, um, and which I think people who are into particularly like Laura Olympus and and that sort of genre of reception of Persephone, I think that's the Persephone that they they really get on board with without oh, okay. even knowing it probably. Yeah, well, it's yeah certainly not the standard because, of course, you're right. Like the standard is the Greek, the Homeric hymn, and Demeter specifically and all of that. Well, why don't we dive right into that? Like do you want to give me a rundown of what that Persephone is and what the differences kind of are? Yeah, sure. So I guess, I mean, beginning with the Persephone and the the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which is, you know, 7th century BCE, um, probably written mainland Greece, uh, and that is really the story of the abduction of Persephone. And then in the middle there's like this big bit about uh, Eleusis um, and the founding of the Mysteries of Eleusis. And then at the end it kind of all the the marriage of Hades and Persephone kind of wraps up. And that is the very well-known abducted maiden Persephone. At the end, though, of that myth, she does, this is where I get, I find it very conflicting, a bit complicated, is that Persephone refers to herself as Hades' wife. She accepts that role. Um, But the Southern Italian Persephone, who we find predominantly in some of the longer uh, Orphic gold tablets of the late 5th, 4th century BCE, and also very, very predominantly in the cult uh, of Persephone in Locri, in the southern Italian uh, settlement um, colony of Locri, is very much the almost the more uh, Homeric, Odyssey-esque uh, Persephone, who's like the main ruler of the underworld. Mm. Um, there still is the abducted maiden motif in the Locrian cult. We have these beautiful terracotta plaques, which are all different. They're, they're obviously not mass produced and they're only very small that show girls being abducted. Some of them show who we think is Persephone being abducted by a young Hades. Some of them show uh, girls and their grooms in imitation of the divine pair. But alongside that, there are also these brilliant, brilliant uh, depictions of Persephone enthroned, sometimes with Hades, though he's always in the background, and sometimes just having people come and give her wedding gifts. Um, And we're pretty sure that they do represent wedding gifts. Um, Some of them are pretty standard sorts of things that you would get, vases, that sort of stuff, Um, and also pretty standard Persephone stuff, wheat, pomegranates, roosters. Um, But she is always the one in the forefront. And the Persephone that we find on the these gold tablets which are connected we think most likely to some kind of Orphic Bacchic mystery cult which is eschatological in nature so is definitely related to the passage of the soul into the underworld Um, and they contain these variations uh, on poems that basically give the soul instructions on what to do after they die to go and and not drink from the fountain of forgetfulness rather to drink from the fountain of memory things like that and the Persephone that we find on those is completely sans Hades he is just not there she is the one who gets propitiated she is definitely the one in charge there are sort of two schools of of thought on these and I kind of fall down on this side of she's the one in charge, she's the one that you have to go and give your thanks and gifts and all of that sort of stuff to prayers, etc. when you reach the the underworld. So Hades sort of just isn't isn't there and she's very clearly that sort of what Homer calls, you know, dread Persephone, the very mm-hmm. powerful 
queen of the underworld rather than the abducted maiden who kind of slinks into the background. I that's fascinating. I find I think it's almost like the the version I've gotten and I, you know, tend to refer to as many sources as I can find, though I'm not an academic, so it's sort of whatever I can get my hands on, but I've gotten pretty good at finding a lot. But that it's almost like a combination of of those two because I've always sort of understood her, the, you know, the abduction is pretty dark. Zeus saying it's okay, not telling Demeter. The whole thing is very awful. But then I've always sort of understood her to be sort of what you're talking about once she gets there, that she kind of accepts this as her life and thinks like, okay, well, I'm going to make the best of it. And then is the dread goddess Persephone, the absolute badass, like the one in control. Like Hades is sort of just there. And I've always really loved that. So I can see where the the love of her comes from because I'm, I mean, there's not a lot of goddesses who would get a name like Dread Goddess and get to be that in control of something so important like the underworld. And so, yeah, she's she's very fascinating. And, you know, the change of her name from Corey to Persephone is really interesting. I'm definitely following along obsessively with Laura Olympus now. I really enjoy that she's she's really taken the abduction part out and just been like, that's nothing to do with it. (laughs) This is just about how she becomes powerful and Hades is also there, you know? Yeah, but Rachel plays with that in a really interesting way. So I remember a couple, because, okay, so I don't want to talk too much about it because I know that I am at like the... I, I pay for the newest episode. Me too. Episode. Yeah, me too. So we'll, we won't spoil that, but we're both there. Yeah. <laughs> At least 10 episodes now. So not spoiling for anyone. <laughs> um, there was a section where I think it was Hermes turned around. It was like when Persephone was, no one could find her. Mm. And Hermes was like, went down, saw her in the underworld, kind of put it together. And he was like, oh, this is the the abduction, right? And It was really subtly done, but like obviously a nod to that aspect of of the myth that I really, really love. And Supergiant's game Hades plays Mm. with, with that a little bit in the same way. So one of the things about myth is that, and I'm sure this comes up again and again on your show, is that, you know, it has to say something about the way that people really live because otherwise it doesn't resonate. And you know, there would be girls whose dads organized their marriages to someone they'd not met, who was significantly older than they were. And they weren't sure and scared and felt, you know, this trepidation and mothers who feel overprotective and, you know, come in and be like, oh, are you sure this is the right person? And, and, you know, dads who think, who cares, this is going to get us out of debt or going to get us more land or, you know, this political advantage or whatever the case may be. Though not to say that dads aren't ever, you know, concerned about their daughter's emotional well-being because who knows? Hopefully some of them were at least. (laughs) Yeah. I think we have to imagine that at least some of them are, right? Definitely. (laughs) But then when 17, 18-year-old girls go to their new husband's home and become wives and eventually you know settle in whether that's within weeks or years and make this house their own home you know that actually reflects people's real experiences and particularly in societies where girls get married so young that must represent people's real experience and so you can see how that kind of resonates to have this uh, the the first part of the myth where there's obviously a lot of vulnerability and fear and self-protection but that you also want to have that end of the myth where you are a woman and you are in control and you do get to you know have your fingers in all the pies of the house that you live in and that you know I can see how that could be very comforting and that's why I think that that why that roundedness happens in this lockery and cult in southern Italy because this is predominantly a marriage cult. These terracotta plaques, pinnacles, are at least most of them we think are dedicated around marriage, um, whether that's sort of as part of a wedding ceremony or in like the the preparation part of betrothal or or whatever. 
but it is about kind of getting ready and that's why you have these you know some images which are girls in the guise of Persephone being abducted and somewhere it's Persephone you know enthroned on her own receiving these magnificent gifts and there's all different types of of these abduction pinnacles. Like some of them are incredibly female driven in that like there are examples where the girls are taking the reins to the chariot. Huh. And so it, it represents kind of this, the spectrum of, of feeling around people who are getting married. And I think because Persephone has this long arc, anybody at any girl at any point on that spectrum from you know the girl who feels completely trapped and like she is being taken away from her family to the girl who's like yep I'm ready let's go I'm I'm down with this that you know she can see herself at some point in in the story of Persephone and this is why I think it's really interesting that that doesn't necessarily happen in mainland Greece why I don't know. <laughs> but also I think it's really interesting for receptions of Persephone that play with, you know, in, in the way that Laura Olympus does, play with this idea of like vulnerable, sassy Persephone. Yeah. You know, she's kind of, she's in there. Yeah, and she can almost be anything, which I think is shown a lot in Laura Olympus too. Like she has very broad personality and and I'm so thrilled that you've just told me all of this I think (laughs) I I find it really comforting because I mean obviously like what I talk about most is the treatment of women and how so many of the myths just did women dirty and just like you know it's depressing and you know that it's because it was you know for the most part the men telling these stories or at least the ones writing them down and or the ones that survived and and so all that we have is that and it's not necessarily all that they talked about and all the stories they told but it's all we know now and it makes it look so dark and because I'm not in the world of academia and like I really don't know where to look for really you know the less mainstream I should say like I've gotten you know I I definitely have things that are well beyond what anyone coming at it would be able to find but at the same time I, I haven't been in academia in like almost a decade and so it's it's so I'm so glad now that I'm talking to people like you but who specifically that story is just so it's like warm and fuzzy like the idea that there was a possibility that that things existed to comfort women specifically for these things that would have been scary and would have been really daunting as as a young woman and that yeah there you know there were people trying to comfort them to show them that it would be fine and to show that they could take control in their house and they could like find some kind of agency in their lives all and and surrounding the idea of persephone like that's just and and surrounding the original notion of the abduction all this context is really like completely blown my mind when it comes to that and i think i think it's so necessary especially with the way i tell the stories which is a lot unfortunately all i have to do is is say like you know the women were treated like this but that's because that's what we have and and certainly that's not the case of how it was back then but it's all we have and you know there's all these different things and so I like to think about what the truth might have been or what what might go beyond what we have today. But it's hard to find any kind of evidence for that. So to have that evidence that there was like a little bit more than certainly than the Homeric hymn, but then also just, you know, the general what we have, like you say, from mainland Greece, which I think is often this like very patriarchal, like very women are just property and they just really mess with people and do very little good and are mostly just conniving and troublemakers. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and I mean, like, the, I don't sort of want to give the false impression that in this city in southern Italy that girls and women had more power, more autonomy. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, to me it's very obvious that these terracotta plaques are dedicated by the girls themselves and that they have some kind of hand in choosing what the representation is. So in that sense, I feel like 
you know, this is a piece of evidence that we have that probably is directly from women who are going through this experience who have chosen, for whatever reason, to use Persephone in a way that we don't find her in mainland Greece. Mm -hmm. I went through this phase where I kind of, I, I did really think about Southern Italian Persephone and mainland Persephone as two very different sorts of figures. But it, uh, I don't know. I mean, that kind of gets into this idea about what is the connection between colonies and their originating, you know, cities. There's obviously um, links between the colonies in southern Italy and their originating cities in mainland Greece. So it's not that easy to say that, you know, a different image of this goddess appears somewhere else and they're not at all connected just like it's very disingenuous I think to assume that people who go to Eleusis and uh, are initiated there dedicating some part of their lives to Demeter and Kore are not thinking about Persephone the dread queen of the underworld even in the back of their mind you know those the two figures are interwoven and probably in ways that we can't really appreciate mm-hmm. now. So I don't know. But at the same time, you know, a lot of me sort of wants to fight against that she was fine with it. Like she obviously mm-hmm. wasn't fine with it. But women in the ancient world in general have to come to some kind of peace with, you know, potentially having to marry their rapists or feeling like they are abducted and and assaulted in marriage, even when that marriage is completely legitimate. And Persephone's marriage is completely legitimate, Mm -hmm. you know, by the standards of the day. So, yeah. And I think that's why things like Laura Olympus and so I've been reading lots of like Hades and Persephone romance novels. which are (laughs) so interesting so interesting Um, and I don't really read any uh, like I don't read other romance novels Uh, so I don't know if they're good or not (laughs) Right. (laughs) but some of the things that people do with you know the relationship that they have and the Persephone feeling abducted or being abducted literally and then coming around to this like happy marriage trope are really interesting and so there's one oh I can't they've all kind of bled into each other I can imagine so I can't remember (laughs) which one this is but there's one in which Persephone was the regular Persephone from Greek myth that we you know know and love and that something happened which is sort of calls back to that Laura Olympus like bringer of death origin story you know, Corre to Persephone thing. And then her memory was wiped and she was basically like put into the mortal world because like she couldn't, they couldn't trust her anymore. And her mortality, her immortality, sorry, was was taken away and all this. And then for some reason, Zeus decides that he's going to mess everything around when they are holding like this series of, competitions to find Hades a new wife okay and he Zeus abducts Persephone from the mortal world she's mortal brings her to the underworld and makes her compete and sort of slowly along the uh without sort of giving anything away I mean the ending is I mean relatively I would imagine (laughs) (laughs) yeah but she sort of slowly gains back her immortality and her powers and her memories of, of what happened or is sort of told what had happened before and, and sort of has to come to terms with, with all of that. And then right at the end, her mortal brother gets brought to, to the underworld to like just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so bizarre. But it kind of goes through in this, I don't know, really naive almost way, exposes something about who all Persephone's are which is like has no idea what's going on is vulnerable is you know needs protecting but then is also deeply deeply powerful 
and it's kind of this coming of age story, which all Persephone stories sort of are about getting to that power. That's really interesting, though, that, well, for one, I didn't know there were quite so many romance novels dedicated to Persephone, but I should have oh assumed. Oh my God, there are so Yeah, many. I should have assumed oh, in yeah. hindsight, because like I, I live in this world of this podcast where I am, it's less so now, I find, but certainly when Laura Olympus was really coming up, I was asked about the romance of those two specifically, like weekly. Like it was so, and the number of people that want me to tell a story where they're romantically in love. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I don't have one. Like, I don't have any problem with people making them, but I don't have one because it's not in the mythology that they were like romantically like in love with each other. That's a fiction. It's just. But like, that's also not realistic for God. No, exactly. Like, I don't think. None of the gods no. are in love with in healthy ways. No, certainly. The closest I think would be like Aphrodite and Ares, but you don't really know that. Yeah, they're yeah. like, they're in love because Aphrodite has all of his children and none of her husband's children. But it's not like we have a lot of stories of like actual like intimacy. We just kind of are like, no, they were in love. Yeah. And when gods, or more specifically, when goddesses really are in love, it's always bad. <laughs> like Eos, who, oh, you know, yeah. gets her lover her mortal lover immortality but forgets to ask for eternal youth and Zeus is just like (laughs) and then she just kind of moves on (laughs) yeah but they I mean that's a really interesting story nothing to do with Persephone but a very very interesting story nonetheless because at some point in his middle age they stop being intimate well that you know stories about their intimacy cease but she still looks after him she still deeply cares for him and still kind of facilitates his transformative existence into this cicada or you know however you want to to read that she still obviously loves him it's just that the form of her love changes Hmm. yeah that was probably my favorite Eos was my favourite entry to write in the Herons of Olympus book, in part because, like, it was one of the only ones that didn't end with me either thinking, I hate Zeus (laughs) or Apollo. Oh, yeah, never good. No, so. uh, I've been bouncing around your book a little bit, just, like, picking out characters to read, and I was just about to start reading Eris when I realised that it was actually time for us to talk instead. Um. But I'd love to, having not read it yet, hear your thoughts on Eris, because I find her fascinating, but also there's so little on her. (sighs) She's so fascinating. I mean, this is part of the problem with all the really, really fascinating goddesses, right? There's nothing on them. (laughs) Is that they all have one thing to do. And like Eris's thing is start the Trojan War. The thing that I love about that Eris story as like the origin story for the Trojan War is it takes all of the agency away from Zeus. And I think that in a lot of cases, the way that myths have been written in the collections that, you know, we all grew up with and that have their genesis in those 19th century collections of myth, they write out a lot of these very powerful, primordial and titanic goddesses to give, like, the moral high ground, such as it is, to... (laughs) Olympian gods, male gods, not the goddesses, obviously. Never. And that, you know, being able to kind of spend time diving into what these goddesses are is deeply reassuring for, you know, a woman who is raising girls, who wants to be able to give something of ancient history of classical antiquity to my daughters to my female students to my male students to you know everybody in a way that is not just like there were these gods and they did problematic things but at the end of the day they're amazing (laughs) because through these primordial and titanic goddesses we can really actively problematize the behavior of those gods Mm -hmm. Um, And this is something that I really love about the way that Supergiant's Hades 
I'm not sure if you've been, if you've played it. No, but I've all. been told to a trillion oh, times. Yes, you should. Yeah, it's definitely on my list. But I'm too into Assassin's Creed Odyssey right now. Still, oh, fair. Because it enough. took me a long time to play that. Fair. That's fair. But yeah, they they have done some really interesting things with particularly the character of Nyx, mm. but also with Demeter. I don't. I just sort of don't really want to go into it too much because there's a lot to say about what they do with Demeter, and, and she is quite problematic in a lot of ways. But yeah, the way that they deal with the primordial, um, and even Chaos, who is a they. Ooh, that seems so accurate. But also, uh, him, mm. which is is very to me felt very genuine. And when they're called they, and when they're called him, feels really telling about the character rather than the storytelling so yeah I think that there's some really you know interesting ways that we can use some of these gods like Eris that you know even just thinking about them and and highlighting that they exist and have you know a lot to do with stories like the Trojan War is yeah amazing absolutely and allows us to you know very confidently and concretely say male olympian gods are not the high the pinnacle Mm -hmm. of of what's going on so that's nice yeah it must have been really anytime i get to dunk on zeus oh same it's my like my (laughs) whole life now i've somehow made a career out of it it's kind of my favorite thing in the world him and theseus really (laughs) i hate theseus so much (laughs) I think I I managed to get that into like almost every conversation I've had (laughs) with people on this podcast is like, so Theseus, he's really the worst. He's so the worst. So the worst. And, and one of those ones, and so like Zeus, where he is so objectively the worst because you just read the stories and you're like, well, this is bad. Everything he does is bad. And yet he is presented in so many ways as like the God. I mean, maybe second to Heracles but often not even like, or not, sorry, not the God, but the hero, like the, yeah. the peak hero. But then you go into what he does and you're like, where is the heroic act with him? Like I can see yeah. where it is with Heracles. I can see where it is with Perseus, Cadmus. I don't think I can see where it is with Jason. But that's another story. Oh, I also hate Jason. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, like when it comes to Theseus, it's like, it even took him ages to to defeat a monster. It was just like him going around killing people that he says were already killers themselves. But it's like, yeah. dude, I want proof. I want proof that you're not like a serial killer who completely rampaged through the peninsula on your way to Athens. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's all he was. He's just an ancient And when he killer. killed a monster, it wasn't even him. No. It was a woman. Well, that's the Minotaur, too. And then, but I think of, like, even the very first being the, the Cretan bull that became the Marathonian yeah. bull. Because even that, it's like, sure, he defeated the Marathonian bull, but he did it just to make the people of Athens like him. So he just paraded it through the city to make them like him and then killed it. Yes. And then, yeah, the first, like, real monster he killed is the Minotaur, and he couldn't have done it without Ariadne. Yeah. I completely forgot about the Marathonian bull, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> it's fair. It's a particularly boring bull when it gets to Marathon. The Cretan bull, that's exciting, yeah. I would say. Slash troubling. But, yeah, I mean, it's not climactic at all like in the story of theseus it's really minor it's yeah it's like people of athens you should think i'm a hero so i'm gonna kill this bull but yeah i mean truly truly no heroic Mm. acts and i mean even with like some of the horrifying stuff that heracles does you know oh he killed his wife and kids yes that's awful but also it was divinely inspired madness you can't say that about Theseus like at no no point exactly is there any redeeming feature <laughs> at all exactly yeah and Heracles then spent like the next however many decades of his life making up for it exactly <laughs> like where does Theseus even try to make up for the fact that he abandoned the woman who saved him on an island yeah and also like raped a 13 year old girl just because she thought he thought that she was like super hot and then tried yeah. to uh, back to Persephone, tried to abduct her because, like, why not? Yeah. Why not? It was truly because he just wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, like, so far beyond. 
<laughs> it's like, okay, well, my friend, was it him who went to get Persephone or did he get Helen and then Perithous got tried to get Persephone? So they both did both. They both wanted Helen and then, yeah. God, I have to try, I had just try and blank Theseus myths. Yeah, they definitely both did both, they both regardless did both. of who was intended yeah. to marry who. Yeah. And then Heracles <laughs> rescued Theseus, Theseus only. only. Which yes. is what makes me think that it was Perithous who was meant to eventually like marry, quote unquote, Persephone. Yeah, it was. Because he was not allowed to leave. Yeah, yeah because he, yeah, he was yeah. the peak awful. <laughs> Yeah, but that sort of it's just makes it kind of worse for Theseus. Oh yeah, like he wasn't yeah. even getting anything out of it. No, he was literally just like, "I'm going to do this." Yeah, it seems like a good idea. Yeah, I'm a good friend. Yeah, <laughs> this is the right thing to do. Like, no, no, buddy. No, no, no. What makes you think deciding to 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 abduct a woman who goes by the name Dread Goddess is it going to be a good idea? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it, you know. It says something about the complete arrogance of a man like Theseus that, like, women are there for men like me and even the queen of the underworld is lower than a mortal hero Mm -hmm. like me. Yeah, it's, like, he's a peak privilege, peak just, like, sheer arrogance and the, the toxicity that comes along with it. Yes. Which, again, is why Heracles is palatable. Mm-hmm. You know, because he doesn't have the same kind of arrogance. No, he really does try to make up for the shit that he yeah. does. And, I mean, it just do- ha- there are some things that he does which genuinely you think, you are a nice guy. Like, when he realises yeah. that Alcesta, y- you know, when he's at Admetus's palace... And realizes that it's Alcestis and not just some rando who's died. He's like, I'll go and fight Thanatos for you. Like, that's a thing that I can do as a mate. Like, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to fight death just to be a good friend. To like, no, I think that's a stretch. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like they're pretty, It's not like they're besties. You know. <laughs> well, it also. I mean, he the things he does certainly in the labors alone most of them you can understand would have been accepted as very heroic things like if there really was a hydra just like gallivanting around the peloponnesian peninsula like i think defeating it would have been really helpful yeah like really beneficial to the people exactly you know do you want to be terrorized by a lion who can't be killed no obviously yeah. not yeah it breathes fire sometimes that's not ideal. No. So, like, a person who comes in and gets rid of that problem <laughs> for you. A hero, I would say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like how much this conversation <laughs> has devolved. It's truly, like, this is how I could spend all of my time. I mean, also, this always just brings me back to, I truly love Greek mythology so much. <laughs> in the way you can, like, have these conversations. <laughs> Persephone. So one thing I'm really, I'm interested to hear how you would answer a certain question that I get asked sometimes, because I have my own answer and it stems primarily from, from Persephone, but my answer is based in like just the things I read and come up with on my own. But I often get people talking to me about how the word rape back then slash certainly more recently means abduction and what do I say about how, like the the idea being it always, it, it's supposed to make it less bad when you consider the word rape being synonymous with abduction. <laughs> it's like, I can't even ask the question without it coming out exactly what my answer is. Yeah. Which is that like, there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I guess I have two answers. One is far more uh, grounded in, historical knowledge than the other Mm. so I I guess I'll start with that in Athens where we have the most evidence in the classical period 
free born women so like citizen women not citizens but you know what mm-hmm. we might refer to as citizen the, women the closest yeah. closest thing to citizens have recourse against being forcibly raped um all, all rape is force but of a certain type mm-hmm. but but you know what i mean not against being seduced and so this oh. is i think where there's you know you could why i think force is important because you know things that we would now rightly consider coercive rape would have then not been considered rape so women and girls did have recourse against rapists legally obviously the person who actually has recourse is their male guardian because they're the person who's damaged legally Ugh. speaking <laughs> yeah um and that's particularly true in the case of girls who are unmarried girls who who are raped um that their fathers then have recourse because obviously the worth of their daughter Ugh. is significantly diminished and so this is something that i kind of always come back to about persephone if she had been legitimately legally legitimately aggrieved she would have had recourse to have Hades punished in in some way shape or form um obviously in her case it's not legitimate at all because it's not a legitimate a- a- attack because it is a legitimate marriage in that because her yeah, Zeus father and Hades gave permission yeah. so what she thinks and what Demeter thinks not not important doesn't matter and i think this is one of the things about the homeric hymn right it's actually a story about an overprotective mother who feels slighted that she wasn't included who in a lot of ways doesn't actually care about her daughter or her daughter's feelings and that's a hill that i will die on and i i fully expect that a lot of people will probably uh, strongly disagree with that i understand it in the homeric hymn context for sure yeah She's she's mad at Zeus yeah. more than she's upset about Persephone. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. She just wants to have... Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> mythically, I guess, you know, one of the things that we often find in what we now call rape narratives, including in the Homeric hymn, is that the sexual imagery is not overt. So we have, you know, she's snatched by force and the the vocabulary for force is definitely there. And sometimes that vocabulary in legal context is used for uh, sexual assault, force in sexual assault. So we can make those sorts of links, but that vocabulary isn't always used for force in sexual assault. Sometimes it's used for other types of force. So there's also that. And then you have obviously all this coded sexual imagery around seed eating and you know the acceptance of hospitality Um, and I know that a lot of particularly undergraduates love to make this link between like the pomegranate seeds and semen and that is not I think that that is not the that's not what the Homeric hymn in particular is getting at Mm-hmm. But it is coded sexual imagery and it's about accepting hospitality. Can I say, so I have never considered it to be that until you phrased it seed eating. And then I was like, <laughs> wait, is that is that the intention? And then so to have you say, no, I'm glad because I've never once considered yeah. it. Like to me, it's always the hospitality. It's the Zania. It's the yeah. like... Yeah, it, it, it's that very important thing of, of ancient Greece. But I, the way you phrased it that way, I was like, wait, have I, have I been wrong? So I, that was extra interesting for me. Well, I do, because I, I do like to very purposefully talk about it as seed eating. Um, mm-hmm. Because I like, in classes particularly, I mean, because I like to very quickly dispel <laughs> that idea. And that it I, is about like, I appreciate yeah, CD, it. Yeah. But that's not what it's about. <laughs> but not, but not like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but then there's also some, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of a way to say this without it, like being super crude, but there are interesting things to say about the idea of ingesting seed, uh, <laughs> And the fact that Hades and Persephone are childless. Mm. Um, 
there are some really interesting there is some really interesting evidence that perhaps pomegranates were used as contra- in contraceptive really ingestibles um predominantly in the near east not in greece but there's also evidence for pomegranates being used in fertility ingestibles so like both sides of that (laughs) yeah that kind of divide and it has neither property so you have to kind of imagine that it's symbolic in both cases is completely symbolic Mm -hmm. because you know we know that a lot of the things that were used for contraception actually you know had some efficacy not in the same way that modern contraception does but Certainly, yeah yeah so you know it's not like they didn't know what what would work for both promoting fertility and also for diminishing fertility so it's interesting that it appears in both um both of those sort of kinds of, of medico magic i've forgotten what i was saying now i went off on a tangent about contraception no, i mean i'm very glad because I'm so excited to have learned all of that, but it was originally discussing the the term rape oh, yes. meaning abduction. Mythically, I think a lot of the the sexual imagery of and sort of I mean in a very mechanical sense the sexual imagery, not like the sensual imagery or anything like that. Mm. Like the imagery of forced sex, aka rape, is coded. In a lot of cases. Right. In a lot of cases, it's not. You know, when Poseidon rapes Demeter, when he's in the guise of a stallion and she's in the guise of a mare, that's very clear. And, you know, in particularly, I think, and I'm sure that if I'm wrong, someone will correct me. I think the way that Apollodorus tells it is a very much explicit, open, this is forced sex. But in a lot of cases, it's not. It's like being forced into things or like the the vocabulary, I mean, is about around force and violence rather than around sex. Right. And therefore around rape because it's forced. So I guess my answer is like (sighs) it's very difficult Mm. and it's also very difficult to, as much as we might try, to disentangle our own ideas about sexual politics, about rape, about sexual orientation, about, you know, acceptable legal practices around sex, um, consent and, and all of that sort of stuff. So like the whole gamut of the of sex and sexuality with ancient application, not mm-hmm. even ide- not even ancient ideas of sex and sexuality including rape, etc., cetera, um, and rape culture, but just like their actual application, in part because the evidence that we have is written from a very specific perspective in very limited circumstances and is usually pushing some kind of agenda, mm. whether that is mythically or legally, there's you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to to get an idea of what a person on the street would think about these sorts of things. Right. So kind of coming back full circle, that's one of the reasons why I think that there's a lot more to to say about the Persephone cult in Locri in southern Italy. And, you know, I think it why I personally keep kind of coming back to to researching this this cult and these girls and the evidence that they leave because it can show us something of the attitude of the lived experience of girls who are going through this very particular experience which is a common experience but that doesn't mean that it's not deeply deeply personal and individual and the fact that we find you know such a variety of representations 
as I mentioned before, of you know, like some girls who obviously are representing themselves as being abducted, and you know, in that kind of really stereotypical Persephone abduction pose where she's like flinging her arms back and you can tell that she's kind of yelling back into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, Bernini, very specifically, I'm thinking yeah. of. <laughs> yeah. Right through to girls who are clearly like jumping on the back of that chariot hmm. and taking the reins. So I think, you know, in terms of the folding rape and abduction together, I think that's a really, it's a difficult path to go down. It's not wrong in all contexts, but it's wrong enough in some contexts to make me wary of saying that it is something that we should always read abduction Mm. as rape because the evidence that we have from real people who lived in the world and were interacting with these myths suggests that at least some of them didn't view it that way. Mm -hmm. That was a very long-winded answer. I'm glad to hear it, though. I am. (laughs) Because I I asked specifically because, I mean, for one, I get asked it a lot. But for me, the way it tends to be asked is more like, and and it might be my reading into the way it's asked, but it's more like, oh, I had somebody or, you know, a teacher tell me that the word rape meant abduction and therefore it's not rape explicitly or or just primarily um but for me my answer is typically like and it you know I usually preface with this is not an academic answer it's an answer based on like all of the myths that I've read and and everything that I've read and it's simply that it seems to me there's very little reason to parse it unless you're going into the depth that you just have I think that that is like that's a good reason to to explain that difference whereas the way it often seems to me is more to to lessen the experience of some that were definitely explicitly rape. And to me, it's like, okay, well, sure, you can say that. But if it, if the person was abducted forcibly, the t- stories typically then led to marriage. And so if it was forcibly abducted, the likelihood is that they were then assaulted. And of course, it, it wouldn't have been seen like that back then. They were married. But in terms of experiential it probably often did. And so that it seems to me that like to be a very male, like a man's reading into it, right? Of like, oh, no, no, like, yeah, rape just meant abduction. So it, it's not bad or or it's not as bad. You know, that also kind of suggests that being abducted is not traumatic. Well, exactly that too, right? And it's- Like even if you're abducted and not raped, like – that's horrifying. Absolutely. Kidnapping is bad. <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we even have myths of failed abductions mm. or, or failed rape if you, you know, if you want to read through them. Like, I mean, the one that I always come back to is Daphne mm. mm-hmm. where, you know, she is going to be abducted and raped, mm-hmm. like hands down. Definitely. And she's only not because – she's transformed into a tree but she's still assaulted physically after she's transformed and that's still deeply deeply distressing for her so yeah the idea that like oh rape just meant abduction yeah I guess you know I can kind of see that it's an easy way to not have to talk about consent politics in the ancient world if you don't want it. Yeah. Which is a cop out. Yeah. That's what it kind of comes down to me. Exactly. And and I think that, yeah, unless you're going to explain it the way you did of the evidence of why it is and is not, you know, cut and dry, like that I think is is really fascinating. That's why I'm like, I'm very glad I asked you because it, it tends to, it seems to me more like, yeah, the usage is more to, to just ignore the trauma that exists in Greek myth and my like explicit purpose in this podcast is to not ig- ignore yeah. the trauma that exists in Greek myth which is like primarily how we get these stories you know I I think at least mainstream books of Greek myth that explicitly talk about the sheer volume of women that Zeus abducted are rare <laughs> if not like nearly non-existent and so yeah I mean I think it, yeah it's just a, it's an interesting thing to me to hear that that that's comes up and I'm always kind of very glad to come at it and just sort of not even necessarily answer the question but just have the 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 person think about the way what they're asking 
Like, cause if you just think about it hard enough, you could understand how it's clearly like not, you know, it's yeah. not different. <laughs> it's like, yeah, sure. They're synonymous, but I, I would say it's more likely they're synonymous on the, the, rape side than yeah. the abduction side so it's just yeah it's an interesting thing to even mm. just think about there's also the, that just reminded me there is like a whole series and i don't know that much about them probably i should know more a whole series <laughs> of iconographic representations of theseus abducting women as like Ooh. a marriage-esque trope on i'm pretty sure also on terracotta plaques that there's so I only really know about these because in a lot of particularly older articles about the Locrian plaques, they always begin by saying we have to remember that these aren't Theseus, even though everywhere else that you might find these, they'd be Theseus. These ones aren't Theseus. So I find that really interesting. Oh, um, God, I haven't thought about those for ages. That's um, yeah. I'm interested. Yeah. Oh, all of this is just it's so fascinating. I mean, I'm I'm so glad that I get to talk to people like you who who actually study it actively because I find there really is in, unless you're in academia, like you just don't hear about anything and it's very hard to find anything if you're not like in that world or in those systems, you know? And so like the amount that I want to know, but I just don't have access to it. There, yeah, there's so much that isn't that isn't easy to find. I, I have to say your your book is kind of like all I want in the world of just like a, a book of Greek myths that focuses on the women and very glad that it exists. I am too. When Izzy, my editor, approached me about it, about writing it, I was a bit like, surely this already exists. <gasps> and if only did some sort of digging around and was shocked that it, nothing sort of of that ilk written for not children kind of didn't exist even for children and this is something that you know I talk about often with my nine-year-old because we she you know is being raised by two ancient historians she obviously is uh deeply deeply involved and I I kind of want to write the kids version of this book because Mm -hmm. with her like using her as my sounding board because you know like even a lot of really beautiful well-written well-researched accurate myths for kids books still focus on the heroes and the trojan war and heracles and you know kings heroes and gods and goddesses but no women no other women yeah and only like the big goddesses I would imagine there's also, like, I mean, the way you'd have to write around Zeus. Like, I don't, yeah, I mean, I I would be interested to hear even how they go about it, even the best ones, because, I mean, there's no real way of getting around it. And the only way you can do it is by lying, by, like, rewriting what the actual evidence is to say that he wasn't a serial assaulter. Or completely a missing. Yeah. You know, a lot of the really good ones in my experience i'm thinking particularly of of hades and persephone representations here because i obviously have a specific interest in that and so i read them far more carefully and a lot of them do kind of draw on this concept of non-consent in an age-appropriate way Mm. and you know i know that that it is kind of something that gets touched on in particularly those myths of transformation like Daphne, where there is, that's presented as not unproblematically, presented in like through the lens of empowerment that Mm. she decides to change rather than being assaulted. (laughs) That's a bummer. Yeah. Which, you know, for like a six-year-old, for argument's sake, I can completely understand why you would want to go that that route Mm because... But also, yeah. like, having had a six-year-old who was interested in myths and wanted to know more, and I was always very open with her about what, you know, these things mean, she definitely could have handled this idea of, like, yes, Daphne consented, in a sense, to being transformed into a tree, but actually what Daphne wanted was just to be left alone. Yeah, I mean, she was forced to make the decision exactly to turn into a tree (laughs) exactly and that's still you know about crossing a consent barrier 
Mm -hmm. Greek myths are excellent for helping young girls understand issues around consent and bodily autonomy. I mean, it's one of the things that I think when people always say to me, like, you know, but what's the point of these stories now? They're just stories. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they are. They are just stories. But, you know, it's about the way that we use them as a society to make things better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, they are, you know, human stories. They're, and I think that they show that the, the, the th- ways in which humanity has always been the same. I I find certain stories of, you know, trans characters or, you know, what, what we could now see as trans characters to be so important because you can talk to, you know, an awful transphobe today and say, who you know, the, the type of person who's going to say, well, it's brand new and what are all these trans people coming out now? Whatever. And it just say like, well, the ancient Greeks had multiple stories of people we can now see would be, uh, would identify as trans today. Like it's literally always been like this. You know, there's certain things that are quite important to be able to look back and say that 2,500 years ago, longer, you know, the same things were happening. The same human experiences were taking place. And that those the people in those myths get to transition mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like obviously not medically, but magically. Yeah. And that's the same thing. Yeah, it's a like, god helping them to be the person they are. It's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I love those ones. I mean that yeah, it's just fascinating. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, as we've sort of talked about, you are the author of Heroines of Olympus, which is a wonderful book. Is there anything else you want to promote at all? Um, oh, my TikTok. <laughs> yes, I know. I retweeted one of your TikToks today because I'm not on it, but I'm glad you put it on Twitter. So <laughs> I'm super excited about, like, I've been thinking for ages about starting a TikTok um, because I love the format of just these, like, quick Mm -hmm. 60 second so yeah they're about going to be about greek myth the underworld um but i'm also going to do some like highlights of single objects where to talk about the object so the first tiktok that i did was one of these on the um frasaclea core which is my favorite piece of greek anything So yes, go and check out my TikTok and follow me. Whatever you do on TikTok. What is your TikTok handle? It's <laughs> I I will tell you. Great. I will put it in the episode's description. It's Ellie Mac and Roberts. All one word. Wonderful. I will put um your Twitter if you want it and and your uh TikTok in the episode's description so everyone can follow. Thank you very happy too i saw your cerberus one which made me very happy because i never knew the truth about whether or not it actually meant spot so everyone should check out that one too yes it's it is made me very sad to have to say it wasn't (laughs) but i did get in like my i was very happy with the ending yeah i really i think you really pulled it back and you made it just as interesting (laughs) as if he were actually named spot so i appreciated it (laughs) Uh, well i'm pleased (laughs) <laughs> good uh, well thank you again thank you so much for having me oh nerds thank you so much for listening like i said this was really just an incredible episode i absolutely love just learning more and more and then by extension teaching it all to you with these conversations i am so thrilled with them this is the last one of the official women's history month that said i'm going to keep it going not every week because it's a lot of work for me and a lot of coordination, Um, but they will keep coming. And we're going to go back to doing some readings from ancient Greek texts on the Friday episodes. So stay tuned for all of that.
Thank you all. You are all the best. Hey, have you pre-ordered my book? Go to mythsbaby.com slash book for places or just search Live Albert at, you know, any bookstore or wherever you get your audiobooks. Whatever the hell you want, I would be so grateful. I am Liv and I love this shit. Thank you.